Well, hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. On behalf of the Institute of International Studies of the University of Chile, we are holding now the session called Net Neutrality and COVID-19 Trends in Latin America and the Caribbean and, and the Asia Pacific. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all the people ha who has joined the panel, Raquel Gato, Olga Cavalli, Dilmar Villena, and our online speakers also, Javiera Cáceres, Felipe Muñoz, eh, and Piero Guasta. So um, we will talk about now about why is net neutrality important for our countries? Why are we making a link between Latin America and specifically the Pacific Alliance within Latin America? And why we are linking it with the Asia Pacific? We will address a global discussion comparative regional processes regarding net neutrality. And for instance, just to make, uh, uh, to start the conversation, uh, the presentation of the paper that uh, Professor Javier Cáceres and Felipe Muñoz will make, they will talk about, for instance, that an important outcome uh, is the, that the four members of the Pacific Alliance, which are Chile, Colombia, Peru, um, and Mexico, the four of them have regulated in law the principle of net neutrality, and that had as a result that the Pacific Alliance, as an organization uh, and uh, in the trade protocol, they set the principle of net neutrality in an international treaty, uh, setting an important precedent in international public law. Um, that's why the, uh, our first presenters will present the paper Net Neutrality exceptional, Exceptionality, a look into the Pacific Alliance countries during the COVID-19 pandemic and lessons for Asia-Pacific economies. This paper is now in press in the framework of the call for proposals of the UN Economic and Social Commission for the Asia-Pacific, UNCTAD, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, and um, ARTNET. And this call for papers is called Unleashing Digital Trade and Investment for Sustainable Development. The presenters of the paper, uh, I will present every speaker uh, when, uh, when the time to talk arrives. Our first presenters are Professor Javier Cáceres Bustamante, who is also one of the author of the paper. She is an instructor professor at the Institute of International Studies of the Uni University of Chile and also a PhD fellow at the London School of Economics and Political Science. I'm Professor Felipe F uh, Muñoz, an associate professor of the, international, uh, the Institute of International Studies of the University of Chile. Uh, the two professors and I are the authors of this paper who will, uh, which will start the conversation of, of this principle in our region. So Professor Cáceres and Professor Muñoz, thank you very much for joining us online. And please, whenever you want, you can start and present um, the, this research topic on net, net neutrality. Thank you, Ignacio. Well, good afternoon and good morning to all of those participating either on site or virtually in this panel. I don't know if you can see my um, PPT because I asked uh, Piero if you could uh, project it. I don't know if Piero, yeah. Yeah, now it's now we can see it. Okay. Well, you can see it. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, first, I would like to thank you, Ignacio, for convening such an interesting session. Um, it is my pleasure to share with you the finding of our research project, project as you were saying, specifically on net, net neutrality, exceptionality in the Pacific Alliance. And how from this experience, some lessons can be taken for other economies, including those of the Asia Pacific. Um, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be presenting. Felipe is here too, but I'm be the one presenting. Uh, next, please. Uh, first, we'll start with uh, an introduction that now you can see on screen. Um, well, it's not new that the information and telecommunications revolution has changed the paradigms of production, consumption, and even social interactions. The COVID-19 pandemic allowed us to witness the extent um, of the internet as an essential tool for individuals and businesses. 
So in a moment dominated by restrictions on social distancing, digital tools enable people to connect and collaborate with others across the globe. Uh, during the pandemic, as we all know, the importance of the internet as an essential tool for people, businesses, and the digital economy has surged. Uh, so several activities turn into digital environments as a consequence of the pandemic, ranging from, for example, remote working and education to the rise of e-commerce or the increased use of digital platforms too for social communication and leisure activities. So in this context, our research focuses on studying how the Pacific Alliance economies have regulated and managed the principle of net neutrality during the COVID-19 pandemic in order to draw some ideas that may provide insightful information for policymakers or using net neutrality principle during exceptional circumstances. Next, please. Now, this is a bit of a, kind of a theoretical framework or literature review. Um, so I don't know, yeah, there. Um, according to Tim Wu, Internet Service Providers, ISP, should be required to treat all internet traffic equally without discriminating or, or charging different based on user, content, website, platform, application, type of attached equipment, or method of communication. So this is the basis of the net neutrality principle. If not, as this author, this author argued, um, internet service providers could become internet gatekeepers, controlling access to information and stifling competition and innovation. So this principle seeks to prevent um, internet services providers from blocking or slowing down access to websites or applications or ch charging consumers extra fees for faster or prioritized access to specific sites or applications. So net neutrality can be defined as an essential as essential to ensure that the internet remains an open and level playing field where all users have equal access of information to the information and to services. So for this reason, and to provide stronger regulatory framework, we can see that some countries have already decided to incorporate the net neutrality principle as part of their negotiating, negotiating mandates in their free trade agreement negotiations, including for, as the case of analysis that we are presenting, uh, the economies of the Pacific Alliance. Next, please. Here we see a little bit of more of information regarding net neutrality and COVID. So uh, we, as I already mentioned, the use of the internet skyrocket uh, due to the rise of COVID pandemic. So the population used the internet for communication and leisure purposes, including video calls and streaming services. Various activities moved into virtual environments. So the increasing usage of network limited the capabilities of internet services providers to provide the required broadband, broadband width. So uh, this problem was particularly relevant in developing economies in rural areas and for those who did not have the access to broadband land connections or latest generation mobile connections. So to ensure that citizens could access to the internet, particularly those uh, that are digital and digital enabled services considered critical, governments impose different measures and policies like zero rating or the price discrimination between digital packages in which companies may discriminate regarding the price they will charge for a specific uh, content uh, prioritization, both type of measures that could be understood as inconsistent with net, net neutrality principles. Next, please. But also there is important to see here that uh, net neutrality should not only be seen as a technical issue related to the governance of the internet, but also as a tool for development. So while there is no explicit reference to the net neutrality principle within SDGs, it can be stated that the net neutrality principle might promote more equitable access to the internet, might not allow in discrimination concerning access to various contexts distributed in a digital environment. So hence, uh, the relationship between net neutrality and the SDGs becomes significant as the internet has proven to be an essential tool for achieving SDGs. Uh, here we can see on screen some examples of how net neutrality could be um, could help the achievement of SDGs are shown here. So we have first, for example, that and we might think about SDG 4, which is quality of education and the need to access educational resources and online learning platforms, for example, or SDG 8, which is decent work and economic growth and the increased job creation in the digital environment. So uh, we can see that both activities are dependent on the access to the internet for which any discrimination by internet services providers could hinder the capabilities of the population to participate in that. Next, please. 
Uh, thank you. Um, so the Pacific Alliance because an inter becomes an interesting case study as the regional bloc has established as one of its main working objectives, the construction of a regional digital market. Uh, various presidential and ministerial declarations and roadmaps have been elaborated towards achieving this objective in which those instruments express the cooperation on net neutrality is necessary to, I'm quoting, create an enabling environment to promote the exchange of digital goods and services. So moreover, during the amendment of the additional protocol of the Pacific Alliance, its trade instrument within the, the alliance, uh, the following provisions were adopted. So I'm going to quote here Article 14.6 uh, of the um, uh, Commercial Protocol, which is part of the telecommunication chapters, which says that each party shall adopt or maintain measures to ensure compliance with net neutrality. So uh, while countries may have their own measures to achieve this objective, the common goal of net neutrality is committed at the regional level within the alliance. Next, please. I'm sorry for this slide and the following one. I know it has a lot of information. I think we can afterwards share uh, the presentation. So I'm just going to summarize this. Um, we can see here that um, the four countries in the Pacific Alliance have implemented policies looking to ensure net neutrality. So our research found that Chile was the first country to adopt these measures. Um, to a large extent, uh, the other three economies have replicated the Chilean mo model with small variations. Uh, what is most interesting here and relevant for our discussion today is the final column, uh, because here we can see that the information, uh, here we can see information on how these countries have addressed exceptionality during COVID-19 pandemic. So it is concluded that while existing laws on net neutrality are imposed, there is policy space allowing countries to implement exceptionality measures to ensure that access to critical digital services, asset occasion or health related was possible during the pandemic. So prioritization was possible under the event of the pandemic declared by the uh, World Health Organization as happened also in Colombia. And we also see that traffic management measures for emergencies were also put in place. Uh, also, for example, Mexico defined that this kind of exceptions could be granted if there was a risk to the integrity and security of the net network or private communication of users, exceptional uh, technology congestion, and also emergency and disaster situations. So therefore, a net neutrality principles was not incompatible with an emergency situation. Next, please. So this analysis takes us to Asia Pacific economy. So while the use of net neutrality uh, has been widely discussed for countries in the Asia Pacific, most economies in this region have not yet implemented formal regulations regarding net neutrality. So there are various reasons for this lack of regulation being one common acknowledgement that the stakes are high for both consumers and industry holders and states don't want to lose the possibility of controlling traffic on the internet. Nevertheless, we can find some cases in India, Japan, and Singapore, for example, where country, these countries have already implemented um, in different extents uh, net neutrality regulations, as you can see in this slide. So um, I'll, as I mentioned before, I know I don't have much time left, so I'm going to afterwards um, share this presentation. Next slide, please. Here we can see so um, the comparison between the three main integration processes. We have the Pacific Alliance, APEC, and ASEAN. So as previously mentioned, as significant development and the level of binding instruments and working documents with a focus on the regional digital market, all of them addressing net neutrality has been taking place in the Pacific Alliance. In the case of APEC, we can see that net neutrality sorry, has been highlighted in recent years in relevant working documents, which may eventually lead to a leader's declaration, but it's still no further progress has been achieved. While in the case of ASEAN economies, there is no relevant um, advances to establish that uh, the net neutrality principle is part of their agenda, pointing out the differences between member economies too. Next, please. So to wrap up from our research, it can be stated that members of the Pacific Alliance began with incorporation of the net neutrality principle in the trade protocol of, this, of the Alliance. So in turn, the adoption of the principle by the four countries, not only closing time, but also their connection points have been highlighted in key issues to promote the digital economy and in 
to intra-regional trade as they intersect in subjects such as uh, traffic man management measures, transparency, compliance mechanism, and references to international technical standards. Uh, regulation details regarding traffic management measures in a way that would uh, allow the adoption of measures to prioritize traffic and data for essential services in time of emergency, such as the pandemic. So in this regard, the full regulation standard for the level of detail and for the instructions to which internal services providers must adhere, being able to manage data traffic in order to ensure the continuity of critical services. Uh, members of the Pacific Alliance made progress in joint discussion that led to the reform of all telecom legislation and subsequently uh, set the first multilateral precedent for the cooperation and neutrality principles in an international treaty. Um, so the Alliance practices align with what members digital trade policy. Um, I just a couple of more ideas before I finish. Uh, the regulation of net neutrality within Egypt Pacific economies has been a matter of divergence. As some countries have built regulations on frameworks to address this issue. In contrast, others have not worked on this topic. So, while well, the topic has been covered in some preferential trade agreements, such as CPTPP, it has not been covered in others, such as, for example, RCEP. Um, next, please, just to conclude. Um, here, I think I think I've already mentioned everything related to COVID-19. So, I'm going to focus on the last two points. So, we see that. Um, um, the Asia Pacific region, particular, particularly APEC and ASEAN, has discussed the concept of neutrality at a multilateral level. However, the experiences in local regulations are still scarce, and many uh, organizations or forums have focused more on the declarative sphere rather than actually um, uh, developing and creating um, regulations. Uh, the Pacific Alliance has offered an unusual normative and political experience. It has significantly developed its binding discussion and work instruments on net neutrality. So I think that this dissemination of information can help us uh, build best practices in the Asia, Asia Pacific region. Thank you. Yeah, next, please. Just yes. Thank you, Ignacio. So Thank you very much, Javiera, for that excellent and clear presentation. Now I give the floor to Olga Cavalli, who is the National Director of Cybersecurity in Argentina. Thank Olga, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Very interesting investigation and, and the outcomes of this uh, initiative, regional. I was wondering, Pacific Alliance, it is because I'm ignorant of how many countries do make part of the Pacific Alliance, if you can tell me. Chile, Colombia, Peru, Mexico. So the ones that, I, that, that you are mentioned, uh, Chile, Colombia, Peru, Mexico. Okay, very interesting that you, that you gathered together to have a, a, a treaty, which I understand that it's, uh, that it's binding to national regulations, which is important because sometimes we, we get together and we do declarations which are perhaps aspirational, and then uh, it, it doesn't reflect what really uh, has an impact at the national level. Argentina doesn't have a specific uh, regulation on on net more neutrality, although the national law on, on, on digital services, I would say, uh, national digital, uh, establishes two articles that guarantee guarantees the net more neutrality for the services in in place. Um, although I, I would I would I have some questions and like philosophical questions about this issue about net more neutrality. Sometimes I think it's. It's a bit aspirational, and perhaps it's uh, it's difficult to think about it in in a world where uh, most of the traffic is increasing and really concentrating, especially in in streaming services. If you look the way that that, that the internet traffic has been concentrated in the last years, you, it's mainly concentrated in. in five, ten main, main companies that deliver services. At the same time, you have the content delivery networks that deliver most of the most of this content into direct, directly to internet exchange points. So at a point, um, trying to, f to do regulations about network neutrality with a reality that most of the content related with streaming goes through private networks and doesn't go through the internet. Sometimes I wonder 
if but this is just a question that I make myself. I, I, in in any way, I'm 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 putting a, a doubt in what you're doing. Sometimes I wonder if if it's something aspirational and really can we can achieve uh, at the same time. Thinking about mobile services, um, the practice of, um, uh, for example, in, in a package that you buy and then you get some services for free or included in, in, in the, in the bound, in bound of services like WhatsApp or some, uh, some uh, not all um, messaging services like WhatsApp, but not every messaging. I wonder, it, that, that's a common practice. Uh, I know that in some countries it was not allowed, like Chile, because you have a specific law uh, on, on net neutrality, but, but in many countries, not only in, in Argentina, it's, it's a common practice. So I wonder if, uh, how can you prevent that to happen uh, if it's uh, something that should, we should really struggle to, to achieve or just bear in mind that it exists? At the same time, I have a question for the, those who made the, the um, the research, um, the inclusion of uh, Internet of Things in the in the mobile networks, like for example, uh, 5G, uh, will include a new way of um, treating the bandwidth, which is called uh, network slicing. Uh, some people think that network slicing is a way of uh, not respecting the network neutrality because you are treating differently different types of traffic. But it makes sense in relation with the service. I mean, you cannot delay uh, 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 an, an autonomous car, uh, the data streaming of that car, because it may hit someone and, and do an accident. But you can delay other traffic. That's, I don't know, uh, perhaps uh, streaming or music or, or a broadcast of, of uh, television or radio. So um, then some, some uh, type of traffic in, in the networks that are being developed now, whether in 5G or uh, I, I also think about this new um, uh, networks related with um, low Earth satellites, should have priority. Uh, if, if you are thinking about objects that are connected and they're providing critical services to users. So that's a question for those who have made the, their, the research and uh, I congratulate you for, for the, what you have done. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga, for your inputs. Uh, now, I believe that you mentioned, for example, zero rating and yeah. Uh, some technologies that are developing. I don't know. Piero, Zero rating if, uh, didn't come no. to my mind because I'm totally jet lagged. I, uh -huh. I, I, I was finding the, the yeah. words in my mind and mm. it didn't come. So thank you for reminding me. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, I don't know, Piero, if I'm speaking uh, on behalf of you, but I think that Piero, who is our next okay. speaker, might refer to Zero rating. I'm not sure. Piero, if you are not going to, don't worry. <laughs> Piero Wasta is. Uh, um, he works in the Under Secretariat of International Economic Relations. Um, he will present a commentary and reflection on the Chilean experience negotiating net neutrality within the Pacific Alliance. Piero, thank you very much, because also um, there's a lot of time difference between here and Chile, so thank you very, very much for being here. Uh, thank you, Ignacio. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, everything is okay technically. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank you, uh, you, uh, Javiera, um, Felipe, for inviting me here. Uh, my first comment are in general that I think this 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 effort is is very good for for me. is is very important. It's key to start uh, discussing this type of issues. Uh, I think uh, as a general uh, problem, if you will, in, in the trade uh, work. Uh, these type of topics are very high behind a uh, more uh, llamative or or that uh, are more um, famous topics. So it's always good to to discuss this, uh, particularly because we are in a in a stage on trade that uh, the civil society is asking why we negotiate, why we are working these topics and. Uh, Internet has the specifically with trade that we are kind of uh, defending uh, uh, the the technical uh, aspects that uh, are born with internet. For example, free data flows, 
uh, net neutrality, et cetera. It's not something that we need to implement in the future, but something that we need to uh, protect, if you will, in, in trade agreements to, to continue that. Uh, it's, a, it's a discussion between colleagues of, for example, uh, how do you implement new agreements like DIPA, like uh, the electronic commerce chapters, um, because it's kind of we already have that. Uh, yes, that is true, but the idea behind this is to, to protect these, these issues. Regarding this specific topic, I will talk uh, again, I'm sorry for repeating myself, um, about the trade perspective, and uh, I will connect that with what Ignacio was saying, in the sense that uh, the view from trade is kind of, I don't want to say economicist, but uh, is the, the, the competition, the, uh, the, the opportunity for companies to export. So. Uh, in our view, uh, for example, it discussed a lot uh, the new uh, measures that some uh, countries took during the pandemic. In the case of trade, it kind of allowed because uh, specifically in the case of Chile, we follow the idea that you can make some network administration, but without being um, discriminatory. So, for example, uh, during the pandemic, you can um, prioritize uh, health services or any other service but you cannot discriminate between different providers. Uh, same idea with the streaming, same idea with um, email providers, same idea with all the, the areas of, of, of the internet economy, okay? So in that sense, I think the, the current uh, legal framework or architecture of, of all trade agreements allow that uh, because uh, again, our focus is uh, non-discriminatory. Um, the idea is to all have the opportunity to, to be able to enter the market. Uh, and that is very important. For example, in the case of the pandemic, there were some initiative or platforms that, for example, Chile uh, developed or Colombia developed. And uh, the idea was to be able to offer that solutions to Pacific Alliance in the same conditions. So in our view, we don't need a specific measures for that. Um, because it, it's already uh, available, and that is the, the, the main uh, the main idea on the main objective on trade perspective. Regarding the, the topic more in general, I, 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 for us has been a, a very useful. Um, I remember some early studies from specifically from one of our our ISPs. Uh, talk that it was very useful to, to have this kind of, of policies because you uh, make the market more, uh, more attractive, uh, more competitors can enter the, the markets and be able to, to, to reduce the, the prices and, and allow more, uh, more digital products and services be available. In the case of Chile, we, have, we are early adopters of almost everything technological and we have almost access to everything that is currently on the internet. We have some particularities that, for example, Asian products that maybe took a little bit long time to, to enter other markets like Europe or the US are very easily entered to, to Chile. Um, so I think it, it has been a, a good practice from, 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 from Chile. I know that the uh, internet has been evolving. Um, uh, there is the old discussion about uh, autonomous cars uh, and prioritizing that uh, uh, the um, digital health um, issue. Uh, but I think we need to, to see how everything is, is, is evolving regarding, for example, streaming. There is a lot of work regarding the reduce the broadband they use. Uh, there is a lot of competition about algorithms that compress images. Uh, Probably it's not broadband is not much important as uh, the latency of the connection. So I think that is a, in a, another point of discussion regarding specific health and autonomous driving. Uh, but uh, again, I'm, I'm closing for not extending too much my my discourse. Um, I think it's 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 a very good paper. Uh, it's good that we continue the discussion. Um, 
I know that maybe we need to evolve this more because again, it's a technical issue that we uh, kind of um, established on the agreement that was already there and we hope to, hopefully we are not going to change in the future. Uh, but it's important to, to highlight that, to see that this is important that we negotiate and other topics in the future. So thank you to the authors. Um, Please, if you have any other question, feel free to, to ask it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Piero, for your inputs. Now I give the floor to Raquel Gato, who uh, he is representing Nick.br, more Nick.br. She will comment and reflect uh, from the perspective of the technical community and uh, speak about the situation in Brazil. Thank you very much, Raquel. Thank you very much, uh, Ignacio, Javiera, Felipe, for uh, for the study and for the invitation to uh, be here commenting. I should start with a disclaimer. For uh, the Latin America folks here in Japan, this is the worst time <laughs> of the day. For it's, us uh, also. For, us also. for all of us. So we're all jet lagged uh, a little bit more by the end of the afternoon uh, uh, because of the time zone. So uh, forgive if some word is missing and if we do look a little sleepy here. <laughs> uh, but anyways, so um, and the, the second disclaimer is I'm a lawyer. I'm supposed to talk about technical uh, uh, community perspective, but I will bring a little bit uh, uh, to, to my side in terms of uh, commenting the regulation. And in fact, in Brazil, uh, net neutrality was and still is uh, a big topic. Um, it was um, uh, interesting, and, and that's what I want to, to bring forward with the questions Ignacio put in the beginning, uh, why it is important, right, and 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 uh, what has been done in in, in each of the countries that uh, that we are talking today and mapping the Pacific Alliance countries and and now Brazil also and Argentina and others. So. Um, uh, for all of you that don't know, Marco Civil of Internet, it's the, the, the Brazilian Internet uh, Bill of Rights or uh, the uh, Internet Framework, uh, how we call it. And it was issued in 2014 uh, after, um, well, nearly five years uh, of uh, public consultations and discussions uh, to really get into uh, principle-based uh, legislation. So um, it's a law, but it, it does doesn't go into the nitty gritty details. And one of the, the perspectives uh, of Marco Civil is to bring the user's rights uh, protection uh, before we go into the criminal penalties that uh, comes with the problems that we know the internet faces. But let's protect the rights first, and then uh, we can talk about um, the, the eventually the, the, the criminalization. And one of the big topics was uh, net neutrality. Uh, I, the first challenge was to make the legislators understand um, what the internet is and how it works and into the technical uh, perspective of open internet working. So uh, how the decisions that you make, uh, uh, even with good intentions, uh, can break uh, this core, neutral core uh, of the internet. And that's, um, that's an interesting exercise that happened uh, because Marco Civil was discussed uh, through public consultations, uh, online consultations, but also face-to-face -face, uh, hearings with the um, the deputies and 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 the ones making the decision. Uh, it was. Uh, really important uh, to have the click, you know, when they understand what are the consequences of their decisions in terms of uh, uh, regulations. Um, and, and then, well, fast forwarding, because we don't have much time, the decision was to keep it um, as a principle of net neutrality to the point uh, Olga was making. Is it uh, kind of aspirational? Uh, and I think at some point, it needs to be because it's a principle. And then you go into the exceptions, uh, and, and the study brings this forward uh, um, very nicely uh, in terms of, uh, OK, so that's what we want. We want to keep it non-discriminatory. We want to have the packages flowing, whatever it, it, the, the content is, uh, where they are coming from, where they are going to, and, and, and so on. Um, but then you need to have exceptions. And, uh, and then it begs for the questions, 
who is deciding what those exceptions are and how are we going to uh, control it or monitor it? I, I'm avoiding the word control, but it doesn't come anything better in my mind. <laughs> anyway, uh, and so um, in the case of Brazil, uh, Marco Civil has the principle of net neutrality as uh, the, the technical one. So non-discriminatory, all packages flowing. But then it, it mentions uh, the possibility of exceptions in case of uh, the need, for example, for a traffic uh, trolling. Uh, trolling, I don't know exactly how to spell that. And then um, uh, to prioritize uh, emergency essential services. And then uh, after two years, there was, uh, oh, sorry. And then Marco Civil ap appoints uh, two organizations that are going to define the rules that those exceptions are fit. So one of this is the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, where uh, I work. So Nick Biar is the, the, the executive arm of uh, the, the CGI that is appointed there. And then it's Anatel, uh, which is the Brazilian uh, telecommunications regulator. So uh, both have put together um, a decree that uh, sets out, lays out, the implementation of uh, those exceptions for net neutrality. Uh, for example, in case of uh, that you have an overload with spam uh, or with uh, the DOS, the denial um, of services attacks. Uh, so in those cases, um, e e of course, you are going to break, you know, and put rules in the middle because e you need to. So the internet uh, keeps working and the network keeps uh, doing what it needs to do. So anyway, uh, those are the, the cases that um, there are already in, in the regulation and that they're being um, uh, put in place. But then, and I'm, I'm fast forwarding because this is the, the question that I have also uh, for, for you guys uh, in terms of uh, your studies and, and perhaps you can expand or just tell if this is something you were looking to, to, to see in, in the future. But um, I think, uh, as I said, after you take the, the principles and after you take, uh, okay, you, you set out, those are the rules, uh, then you need to think on the implementation uh, and, and the monitoring. So how you were going to, um, uh, to make sure that those exceptions are you know, only exceptions and not uh, uh, become themselves the rules. Uh, and how you are going to even prove that, because this is an issue, right? Even if you set out um, an oversight and, 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 and ways to, um, and, and the regulation has some penalties for that, um, even there, how do you prove it? And, and uh, so you go more into making it real uh, than just aspirational. So I'm leaving like that, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Raquel. Um, just to provide a quick answer and then give the floor to Dilmar. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, Effectively, one of the elements that uh, our research, um, our previous research uh, considered, we identified seven elements of net neutrality regulations. And one of those elements are, of course, the exceptions. Because you can have net neutrality regulations, but if you don't have the exceptions, or what, what will the exceptions uh, be, actually, your, the legislation won't be uh, operable, no, it can't be effective. And besides the, um, the exceptions, one of the other elements is the dispute settlement bodies when net neutrality is not taking place. But I do think um, this um, dispute settlement was an element because there you can go when net neutrality is not um, being complied uh, on the part of the ISPs. But I do think that it is um, a challenge, the monitoring. I, th I think the, all the legislation we saw, uh, they lack of a body that actively monitors that everything is, everything and everyone are complying with the principle. Mm -hmm. I have that quick answer for now. 
So uh, now I give the floor to Dilmar Villena, who is the executive director of the NGO Hiper Derecho uh, of Peru. Dilmar, thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitations and congratulations on the paper. On the paper. Um, when talking about net neutrality, uh, right now it's not the hot topic like is AI, but it's always uh, good to uh, talk about it because it's essential part of, of internet, net neutrality. And, um, well, net neutrality as an ideal, as a principle, it's is is also in our Peruvian regulation. But what happened during COVID-18 is like, yes, we have net neutrality, uh, um, regularity bodies implement uh, net neutrality and demand uh, companies to comply it. But uh, pandemic starts and what we are, what we have in front is like, um, all the infrastructure isn't ready for all the flow of information that is uh, that it started at, at that point. Um, no, uh, pandemic started and nobody could get out, and everybody was using their laptops, their cell phones, um, in order to 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 work, in order to I don't know to consume some entertainment. So that in Peru, that's what happened, and I think that happened also in a lot of countries, and. Uh, uh, net were overload. So uh, Peruvian government in that case um, take uh, let operators to take uh, some emergency actions in order to uh, prioritize the flow of some packages uh, to some specific types of um, types of website or services. Uh, talking about uh, zero rating, for example, what happened in Peru? The uh, Peruvian government developed a web page that is called Aprendo en Casa uh, dot com dot, dot pe, uh, and it was the center of information from all the students that couldn't go to school, but uh, in order to learn in, or in order to have uh, access to some educational materials, they could get it uh, through this page, Aprendo en Casa dot pe. And uh, what happens in Peru that uh, students that need to access to this information doesn't have the data packages in, in their de cell phones or doesn't have the money required to buy these data packages. So in, in that case, most of the telecom companies uh, and also because of the Peruvian government ordered that, uh, they put zero rating to access to this uh, web page, educa educational web page. And also Peruvian government, uh, uh, like it, it didn't order, but it suggested the companies to prioritize some types of uh, traffic to, I don't know, uh, traffic for people that are, that are, that are doing uh, remote working or maybe people that are using Zoom or or Microsoft Teams, or all of these platforms to do their work uh, while they stay at home. But um, uh, during the time of the day, but what government didn't take into account is like, um, when, they, when they did these regulations, they were talking like more on the traditional form of, form of, of working. But what happened with person that um, were making money uh, through uh, streaming services that like streamers, like were gamers and streamers, uh, they were, they, they couldn't have the necessary uh, uh, package flow to, to continue doing some streaming and also working be because for most of them, the video gamer streamers, that was their work. So that was a point that also Peruvian government didn't take into account when we were talking about uh, net neutrality. Um, other thing that is very important is uh, Peruvian legislation permits uh, zero rating um, when is it done uh, in arbitrary form. So what is not arbitrary is not that clear. But in, in any case, it demands to telecom companies to be transparent about that. Um, the transparency of companies in implementing this measure is a key concern here. How transparent have been telecom operators in Peru regarding network managing during the pandemic? Um, 
one of the questions we ask uh, whether these companies are adequately communicating their actions and decisions during these uncertain times, those are certain times of the pandemic. Um, among the major operators in Peru, just one uh, at that time was complying with transparency demands on uh, net neutrality. Uh, the other three ones didn't, uh, didn't comply with it, so we didn't know with, to which platforms or for, to which websites um, telecom companies were uh, treating or giving uh, preference and treatment to their data packages. So, uh, and that is what comes to, to my question maybe and what we can discuss about the paper. Uh, in, uh, through the Pacific Alliance, there is a lot there maybe there are two three companies big companies telecom companies that are, that are in our countries no I'm thinking about Peru Chile uh, Mexico maybe now Claro or Intel I don't know um, maybe we can think about how these companies comply with net neutrality requirements in each country uh, and why do they comply more or less in each country I don't know in the case of Peru uh, the um, Intel uh, that is the, from Chile is like seven or eight years in the Peruvian market and actually is uh, complying not much complies and net neutrality disposition on al menos in trans uh, at least in transparency uh, but we have other tech com uh, telecom companies that do comply with um, uh, do comply it so maybe we, well, we can think about it on uh, the future. These are more the same companies, but why do they comply it more or less in some countries when we talk about the Pacific Alliance, no? So, yeah, that, that thing is gonna be for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dilmar. And now that I'm hearing uh, you talking about transparency and you were talking about um, the user rights and the regulations, I am recalling the other elements of the the net neutrality legislation that we studied last year and actually transparency and the user protection specifically privacy are one of the elements of the this net neutrality legislations besides um dispute resolution also um now before closing um i know that uh, uh, professor caceres who presented the paper uh, wants to uh, to go deeper in one of the questions that were made in the panel. Thank you, Ignacio. Well, thank you all the speakers. It was very interesting and I'm taking a few notes. I don't know if I have so many questions or ideas to answer all of your questions, but I think it's been uh, super interesting. Um, regarding to what Olga's, Olga was saying before regarding network slicing, I think, um, we did not consider that as part of our paper. I think that would be something very interesting to consider in future research and maybe like a revised version of our article. But I think it, here it's interesting to see how kind of like both the literature or one like um, how states are actually approaching this topic is it, it's very changing in the sense that um, as when we talk about network slicing, like completely, we could say right away, like no, it is not uh, it's not compatible with net network neutrality. But if we start thinking about it, we see also that um, this also depends on the application and intent. So we see that net, uh, network slicing is, uh, used, is used more like to support specific technical requirements. So for example, low latency for critical services like autonomous driving, for example. Um, so we see that in that case, um, we can see network slicing as a way of optimizing uh, network resources for safety and efficiency. And in that case, when we think about net neutrality, we can see that, yeah, in this case, um, actually the problem with net neutrality is when we're talking about this preferential treatment for a specific ASP. So in that case, in that case, I think we go back to what Raquel was saying, because uh, actually how we monitor, how we regulate uh, both net neutrality and network slicing will be very important to see how actually net neutrality or network slicing is being used so that it doesn't actually become a backdoor violation of net neutrality. So I think that's something very interesting to consider. And also uh, moving forward to what uh, Mr. Dilmar was saying um, I went about this idea of 
uh, have to comply with net neutrality. I think that's also something that wasn't as part of our paper in the sense of following, maybe go like a deeper analysis, even like methodologically speaking of going, talking to companies and actually comparing how they're actually complying with net neutrality. But I think that's also very interesting to consider in future research. So thank you very much for all your comments. Thank you, Ignacio. Yes, thank you, Javier. Also recalling who, um, who decides the, the exceptions, for example, I, I was remembering that when we studied the Colombian regulation, in the decree, uh, they say, okay, the net neutrality principle is established, but the traffic management, they, they can manage traffic while the ISPs comply with the ITU recommendation and they specify an, a specific recommendation. So if they comply with that, traffic management can be done. So that's one of the ways that they oper operationalize the exceptions regarding the principle something else that I recalled on that previous research. Um, I don't know if anyone else has a comment or a question. Please. Yeah. Sorry. Hello. Well, thanks for all the, for the panel. Uh, the authors of the paper, uh, very interesting discussion. Uh, I wanted to comment on what Olga said. Um, most of the network slicing with 5G is something new that's going to stick eventually. Uh, we will have three types of slices. The, the one that most of us will use for sure would be enhanced mobile broadband. Uh, <clears throat> but there will also be using the same physical layer. That's, a, that's the nice thing of, of slicing, is that you will be able to have different <clears throat> logical networks in the same hardware. So you will have massive machine type communication for IoT for having millions of devices and also for the, I would say, very few cases that at least at the beginning with ultra reliable low latency. Um, to me, because what I've seen, I'm not an expert, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an engineer, but, uh, and this has to do also with what uh, Raquel pointed out, uh, the exceptions. The, lo the law says the principles that should guide us, we don't want arbit arbitrary uh, discrimination of, of, of the scheduler, of the way we traffic packages. But there's also uh, the same law usually says, okay, but this is going to be defined in a technical draft. That's, a, that's where the details go. And it's interesting what Olga mentioned because I don't see any technical draft today that speaks about <laughs> discriminating not in the routing layer, in layer three, where usually we are all watching if there's neutrality or not, but underneath it. So that's something for sure we have to uh, analyze and, and see what's going on there, because that's where net neutrality, although in the routing is done correct, it's, it's, it's being respected, maybe underneath it is not. So that's something for sure that it has to be updated in all the technical drafts that accompany, that, are, that go with the laws you know, in, in our countries. So thanks a lot, very interesting topic, thanks. Sorry, that the regulation um, includes exceptions and that it enables good services for, for consumers and for services providers. Um, but but you must have all these things that will happen uh, or are happening right now. So the, because the the environment will change very much from from what it was before, especially considering the amount of uh, Internet of Things devices that will be connected, which is the number is really enormous and it's happening now. So the the idea is that the regulation is is good for everyone and it's not. Um, prohibiting things that are good, but consider them exceptions or part of, a, or modify or more more broad. That's that's a very challenging with any, any, no me salen las palabras, pero estoy dormida. With uh, with all the with all the regulations that are related with technology, it's very challenging because you have to be ample. You have to be you have to be let uh, updates and and the changes in the services. So it's it's a process. Huh? 
Yes, indeed. That's why there's a, a common phrase, at least in Chile, that says the, the law always comes late, and always. especially regarding technologies. <laughs> so, of course, there is a challenge there. So thank you, uh, also you, for your input and the comments. Now I think we might be closing. We are on time. I want to thank all the speakers online and, and on-site for bringing the perspective of Latin America to the IGF of this year. So thank you very much, really, all of you online and on-site. Thank you for also the, the people who attended our session. Thank you for the participation.